like to call Carlos Ramos, who's uh, up as the director of the Department of Technology. Mr. Ramos, we meet again. We do. Nice to be back with you, Senator. Yes, this is uh, another nominee who's uh, coming back because of the uh, reorganization that the executive branch undertook uh, a year or so ago, and as a result, under our rules, um, because you're now the government's organized differently, you you come up for confirmation a second time, and it's it's good, it's timely, it's a check in, and uh, I know we have a few additional questions to ask you, but please introduce yourself again and your, your family, your special guest, and sure. and uh, maybe give us a little update on what's happened with your department since the last time you were here. Sure, uh, thank you again. It's nice to be before all of you. Um, I do have a special guest. I've invited my wife, Valerie Ramos, back here. Welcome to you. She's a, she's a director of religious ed over at St. John Vianney. So, uh, Where's so that? St. John Vianney uh, Church over in oh, Rancho Cordova. Wonderful. So when I told her she was coming for my confirmation, I think she had a different type of confirmation. <laughs> You but could have said you're it. coming for your confession. Actually. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that too. I didn't think about that one. Anyway, uh, our three children weren't able to be here because they're uh, either at work or in school today, but they are here in spirit. Um, I do have a brief opening statement, and I'll keep it very brief and then just Please. answer any questions the committee may have. Uh, since I became... Oh, sure. <laughs> uh, since I became a state CIO... Uh, I took responsibility for a very large and diverse technology portfolio for the state of California. Um, during my time in the office, uh, I've focused really on three significant priorities. We've taken on a lot of reforms and initiatives, uh, but they're really organized around three central priorities. Uh, the first priority is, is safeguarding California's systems, technology systems, and the data that we collect. Uh, each year, we defend against literally millions of attacks and intrusion attempts, and we do that successfully. But there is a very dedicated core uh, and community of bad guys out there that are actively seeking to try and exploit any vulnerabilities they can find in California systems. So information security is a big concern and a big priority for me. I'm happy to talk about the specific initiatives and, and uh efforts that we've taken in that regard, maybe as part of the question and answer uh, part of it. My second priority has been to improve uh, California's track record around technology projects. Um, California relies heavily on technology, and so it's important that we get it right. And when we don't get it right, we get a big black eye. So my focus has been leveraging the state's position as, one, the birthplace of the Silicon Valley and of technology innovation, and finding ways of improving California's track record. We do actually deliver a lot of technology very successfully, but every now and then, one of them goes off the tracks. And so my focus has been on, on improving our track record there. And again, I'm, I'll be happy to talk about any of the specific initiatives that we've undertaken uh, during the Q&A. And then finally, uh, on the topic of innovation, my focus has also been in understanding what are the technology trends and evolutions that are happening. And how are in people in their personal lives using technology to, to, to transact business, uh, to communicate with each other, and generally to make life more convenient for themselves? Consumers bring those same expectations to government. So one of my goals has been to make California a leader in innovation and technology in the public sector. And to that end, I'd say we've been very successful. California, especially when you compare it to other states, really is a leader in, in innovation in the use of technology. Um, I can give some examples, uh, maybe as part of our Q&A. But uh, with that, I'd close and make myself available for any questions. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Let me begin. Uh, you were last before the committee in August of 2012. And, of course, we talked then, as we'll talk today, about that plight of the public sector, where it, it seemingly, um, time after time after time, when it comes to major IT projects, that there are huge cost overruns and or outright failures. And since that August 2012 appearance, uh, an administration task force, which you were part of and I believe headed, 
came out with a report in August of 2013 that listed 21 recommendations for improving the process. And then parenthetically, I would say at the beginning of this calendar year, 2014, the Senate had its annual uh, policy summit here in Sacramento where we had an individual by the name of Clay Johnson, sort of a nationally recognized uh, uh, technology reform guru. That's the way I would, mm -hmm. I would put it. Um, speak to us, and what struck me and what I remember about the presentation, what I want to ask you about, is that he concluded, by and large, that it is a mistake for government to do large, expensive technology procurement RFPs. That instead what we ought to be doing is we ought to be breaking them down into small, smaller sizes, and again, I'm no expert here, but we ought to focus less on building hardware, if you will, mainframe systems, and instead we ought to be using much more of the personal, uh, the PDAs, and, and the software to connect existing, existing computer systems. I'm thinking, for example, about the, the court issue, you remember from several years ago, where Okay, there was this huge effort, expensive, failed effort to build an, uh, one big system to link all the courts. You know, and for obvious good reasons, right? Did the domestic person with the domestic violence restraining order in one county, what about if the other county doesn't know it? And you just wonder what would have been if we had approached it as, okay, every court is going to have their own separate smaller system, but it's simply going to be a matter of uh, of more easily and readily, li yeah, linking them up up in the up in the cloud. So, I guess I want to ask you about Clay Johnson um, and what you think of that philosophy and approach, and whether or not it's serving to change the way you and the state of California is thinking about about big IT. Sure. Um, so I, I did hear a little bit about it uh, during my meeting with Senator Mitchell earlier. Uh, and I have to say, I can't disagree with him. Uh, I think the approach to technology really has evolved and changed over the years, uh, in, especially in the commercial sector. Uh, we in California are doing those things as well. Uh, I'll tell you about a couple of things that we have done and are doing that I think lead us into that direction. Uh, on the area of, in the area of using personal devices, uh, California became the very first state in the nation to get its own mobile app store. So what we have done is we've made it easier for departments and agencies to create uh, mobile apps to transact business with the public and specifically in a mobile platform. Um, we've developed templates that now allow uh, departments to literally in the course of either a couple of days, in some cases even a couple of hours, bring transactions and, and uh, applications online in, in a mobile platform. Um, in, in the area of using the cloud, uh, California, again, is leading in that we're the first state to have a government cloud. One of the challenges with trying to use the public cloud or the commercial cloud that, say, uh, providers like Amazon or other folks use is you don't know who else is out there. You don't know where the, where the, the systems and, more importantly, the data are being housed or what are their requirements or who, are, who else are they allowing to go in and access those systems. So although they, it offers great promise, we as a state cannot just jump into the public cloud. So instead, what we've done is we've gone out and uh, said, okay, Silicon Valley, come in, build us a cloud, but build it specifically for government so that only public sector agencies can use it and build it in our premises. Not only build it, but help us leverage some of those same uh, benefits that, that the commercial sector, the private sector is gaining from it and teach our folks how to manage and maintain it so that the, at the end of the contract, state employees can take over and run it. Uh, we've been successful in that for a state to do it, and we have that effort underway today. I think by the end of the summer, we will have successfully deployed California's government cloud. Um, so we're, we're trying to leverage some of those advantages and benefits. Does that um, mean that we won't be procuring big hardware technology projects going I, I forward? I don't think it does uh, for a couple of reasons. One is California obviously has... Uh, systems and uh, business practices that are of industrial strength and size and scope. Um, and those, some of those technologies, the, the mobile technologies, for example, 
uh, an app may work in certain aspects. Sometimes you just need big industrial strength computing power. Uh, I think we're going to get better at that, and I think some of the uh, the principles that uh, Mr. Johnson mentioned, such as breaking things up or not buying things and building things over and over, but rather uh, creating, uh, developing, for example, uh, a function or a service that can be leveraged over and over again, we are going to be moving in that direction. Um, but, it, but in some cases, you just need big computing power. So I want the other members to ask questions, but I guess it begs. So what, what of these recommendations from August 2013, based upon what we've learned in the past on our past failures, are sure. going to change the outcome then for the big industrial hardware projects that we have to do because the iCloud, so to speak, won't be sufficient to sure. meet our technology needs. So uh, the task force did put out uh, its recommendations, and I'm happy to report that out of the 21 recommendations, I th and I think, in fact, I think the Senate is going to hold a hearing on this in a, tomorrow, uh, where we're going to talk about where we are with each of those recommendations. We are doing something, uh, and in some cases, doing these things uh, before the, the uh, task force even came out with its recommendations in every single one of those areas. Uh, so we're moving on them, I guess, is, is my main point. Uh, which of those would help when we have large technology projects? Uh, there's a couple of things that I think we're doing differently today that will make a difference. Um, first and foremost is that we're approaching these things as not just technology projects, but business transformation projects. So we're making departments do a very thorough job of understanding uh, and documenting what is a business problem that they're actually trying to solve, and how does the application of technology solve that? We're also asking them to go back and, and understand what do they need to change about the way they do business so that when you bring a technology system in, it's a smooth transition and that it actually works and, and resolves your issues. We're pre-qualifying vendors and uh, doing a better job of putting out for the vendors to, com to uh, respond to very clear-cut business problems, very clear-cut requirements of what we're looking for, and then we're developing uh, methods of, of holding vendors accountable once they do come in and, and get under contract with the state. And we're doing a better job of monitoring and understanding what causes these projects to fail. Um, one of the things that we have done is to focus a lot of effort and, and time to understand what are the root causes of the project failures that we've experienced in California. And then we're building lessons learned around them and going back and, and teaching and training the, the state's workforce around how do you get around those issues. How do you address things such as, you know, you missed the mark on how you designed a system or you didn't adequately test the system before you rolled it out? Uh, so we're building training curriculum around those as well. I think in combination those things will improve California's track record. Okay. Um, let, let's, let's turn it over. I know members probably want to get a little bit more in depth in terms of the task force recommendations and specifically because you've touched on some of the, some sure. of the things you're looking at, but a little bit you know, take a real-world sure. example. What will be different the next time we do a major IT procurement that will recognize lessons from the past? Senator Lara? Sure. Thank you. Appreciate the time we had uh, to talk about several issues concerning sure. uh, IT. I wanted to uh, briefly talk about the state auditor's um, audit in September 2013 that stated that the state's oversight of IT projects is an area of high risk. Uh, three of the five IT projects her office reviewed experienced major problems and were terminated. Uh, you have stated in your background that the department is implementing actions, and you talked about some mm -hmm. of those today, um, and, and ensuring that IT projects are delivered successfully. Uh, I want a little more detail on how you evaluate uh, these projects on an ongoing basis. Sure. Sure. So uh, let me start with the process, and then let me talk about the specific uh, items that we look at. Uh, so the process of the way that we evaluate projects, especially projects in flight, because uh, I think the, the auditor, when they were talking about the projects in the report, these are projects that were already in flight when I came in, into office. Uh, so the very first thing I did when I came into office is to do, go out and do an honest assessment of where are all these projects? What is the status of them? And, and really, you know, what's your chance of, of success? Uh, based on that, we categorize them into a couple of different areas. Uh, we looked at some projects that uh, had some problems, but they could be salvaged. 
Uh, we had some projects that were doing okay, but could use a little bit of coaching. And then we came to some a conclusion on some of the projects that they just weren't going to make it. Uh, so what we've done, and what I did do, is uh, stop those projects that we just came to the conclusion were not we're not going to be successful. I think that's one or two of the projects that are listed there. Uh, the projects that, that we thought, okay, they've gotten themselves off the rails a little bit, but they can be salvaged. Uh, our approach has been to go in, uh, bring the vendors in, bring the departments in and say, okay, let's identify what are the root causes? What are the problems here? Is that there's a misalignment between the, the expectations of the state and the vendor? Is it that our contracts don't match up with what we're trying to achieve? Did we pick the wrong technology? Um, or, you know, have there been changes in law, for example, that have caused changes of scope in the project? Uh, and then we brought the, the parties together to negotiate and, and come up with uh, solutions to those, those individual challenges. Uh, I'll give you a couple of examples where that has already paid off. Um, I, I, get, I would take the example of the prison uh, systems project. It's a project called SOMS. Uh, we had some challenges there. In the middle of, this is a project for an offender management system for the entire prison system. There was a misalignment between the vendor and the state in terms of expectations, and the contract didn't quite match up with what the, what the uh, project was trying to achieve. In addition, in the middle of all of that, there was a major policy change that changed the scope, major policy change from the program side, which changed the scope of, of, the, uh, of the project. So, um, and we had a, a couple of issues with vendor performance. So what we did is we went in, we, we coached the department as to, look, these are some changes that you need to put in place. Here are some changes you need to negotiate to the contract and then actually help them to negotiate. Uh, we went to the vendor and said, look, we've got a big portfolio of, of engagements with you in California and you're not treating us like a big customer. So you need to step up your quality, you need to step up uh, in terms of the product that you're delivering, and we need to get this project completed. That project today is almost completed. They've, it's rolled out in the prison systems. They've done, they've just concluded uh, scanning, I think it was like two million records of, uh, of um, or digitizing, let's say, two million uh, records and central files of inmates in California in prison records. So what that means is now, instead of having to ship around big boxes of files and transport them, uh, from prison to prison or, or you know, to courts when, when a, or to the parole boards, for example. Now that gets done electronically. So that project is successful today, and I think it's, a lot of it is due to the direct intervention of our office. So, so that's, I guess, an example I would use. Great. I um, want to talk about Covered California. Sure. And some of the issues that we've heard in the press about in terms of the computer glitches. I know you have a different perspective uh, and I just wanted to get get um, that perspective for the record in terms of was it successful? Were we able to capture this? And did the legislature provide the appropriate oversight? Uh, boy, that's a good question. <laughs> so let me start with uh, with the first part of it. Uh, the uh, I think the system did experience some issues, but it has been successful. It is successfully enrolling people into uh, healthcare benefits and in fact has been held up as an example at the national level. You know, when Obamacare and their website blew up, Covered California worked. Uh, they just held a hearing in Congress, I believe last week, uh, where they called in five states of, with systems that didn't work, and California is the example of the state that did work. Uh, now, it was a compressed schedule, so that means, you know, at the time the federal legislation came down and said, you need to have these things in place, they didn't give the state a whole lot of time to, to ramp up, and especially a state the size of California. But California was successful, and, and I think some of the glitches and some of the, some of the little hiccups that you're seeing today are because they didn't have really an adequate ramp up time, but the system is successful and working. Uh, to the question of, you know, did the legislature provide proper oversight, I would just note this was an example of where the legislature actually exempted that project from oversight from my office. I think we, you know, we could have been very helpful, uh, and we did try to be helpful on a, an advisory capacity, but um, I would encourage the legislature not to do that too often. Uh, you know, it's understandable in this case that there, was, there were short time frames, but, um, but I think that's risky. Thank you. I appreciate your, your honesty on that question. I want to talk about vendors. 
Sure. And what in, in this procurement process do you think we need to do a better job of in terms of ensuring that we get the appropriate vendors to do the job and that we get vendors that are going to be honest when it comes to how much projects are going to actually cost. I feel that some of the vendors already know how to game the system and will underbid, and at the time of them doing the actual work, they uh, come up with all these other problems, and then the, the, the cost of the program or the project skyrockets like we've seen. And to what extent can we actually utilize, given that, you know, we are the Homo Silicon Valley, as you mentioned, we prioritize California vendors as opposed to Canadian vendors? Sure. Um, so, so I guess I would start by, um, by addressing uh, some of the things we have done since we did take over procurement. As part of the reorg proposal uh, in July, um, procurement for big technology projects has been moved over to our shop. The very first thing we did is we went out and asked people, what's wrong with the way we do things today? Uh, what, what keeps companies from bidding? Uh, what drives prices so high? Uh, why do we end up with bad outcomes on projects? And, you know, and, and uh, listen to them. We asked the vendor community. We asked departments that have to deal with these. And we asked the procurement specialists in, in government to say, how could we do this thing, these things better? What we heard was it takes too long to run a procurement. So we've shortened the procurement cycle. We've eliminated you know, bureaucratic processes that didn't add value. We're doing things in, in parallel now instead of sequentially. And uh, we're making departments do a lot more upfront work before they ever go out to bid so that when a bid comes out, it moves a lot faster. Uh, since we've taken over procurement, we set a six-month target between the time of uh, RFP hits the street and we award a contract. And we've been able to meet that. Our, our Cal Cloud was a good example of that. So. Uh, Shortening the, the cycle makes it so that more companies are willing to compete. And if they bid an A-team, they're going to deliver an A-team, rather than saying, okay, we'll bid an A-team, but our procurement takes two years, and by the time we're ready to award, their A-team is already deployed in, in other projects. So that's one thing. They said shorten the time frames, and this, those are some of the things we've done. Uh, the other thing that Vitter said is there's some things that we do as a state that inhibit competition. So we've gone through and systematically addressed some of those uh, barriers to competition. What are some of those examples? Uh, at times, uh, some of the requirements that we have on vendors. So, for example, if a company is going to come in and, uh, and you know, build a system for us, we ask for performance bonds. Not a bad thing to do. Not necessarily an effective way of managing and, uh, and uh, leveraging performance from vendors because... As a matter of fact, the state rarely ever employs those. We never really call them to account. There's better mechanisms for that. So, you know, eliminating some of those requirements helps. There, there are other mechanisms that can work that, that uh, enable bidders to compete. Uh, the problem with performance bonds is vendors get a cap. You know, they can, only, they can only go out and get a certain level before they say, okay, you're not eligible for any more. And if it's a, if it's a management mechanism that we're never going to trigger, and that doesn't really affect, isn't an effective way of managing performance, you exclude vendors from coming in and bid on, on you know, very valuable California projects. Um, the other thing that we heard is we need better communication with the state. Oftentimes, we'll put out a bid, and the way it was before, we would throw it over the, the wall and say, okay, here's what we want. Don't talk to us until you have a bid ready to submit. That's not an effective way to engage the vendor community because the state isn't always clear in terms of how it how it lays out its needs. And a lot of times vendors have questions. And if the vendors have questions and they're not clear, they're going to they're gonna protect themselves from risk by inflating prices or building in a risk factor. So what we've done is we've said, okay, we're going to make our processes a little bit more flexible so that there's more ongoing communication. And we're building in negotiations into the final bid part of it. That way, uh, once, once we go through and have a, an ability to qualify the vendors on qualifications, on their ability to deliver, once we've talked to them and, and uh, been able to clarify, this is what we're looking for, it's not that we're not looking for that, or if they have questions about particular terms and conditions, we, we have a clear un, uh, understanding of what target we're shooting for. Then we're able to say, okay, now give us your bids, give us your best cost or your best quote, Hopefully there's multiple vendors, which drives down cost and drives more opportunity to evaluate uh, technical solutions, and we're able to still negotiate with them. You know, if we come in and find, hey, you know what, we weren't real happy with this, or you made an assumption here that doesn't work for the state, we can, we can come in and still negotiate. 
Well, that sounds very, very promising. I think the, the added, uh, the only thing I would add to that is trying to figure out through all those loopholes that we make people jump through and, and through the procurement is how do we still identify those companies that are being innovative and that are, that are you know, going to help us get to the next level sure. uh, is important. And, sure. and I think by streamlining the process is important, but also from the top identifying and kind of looking at certain factors that, you know, there's some maybe smaller firms, maybe medium-sized firms <clears throat> that are hungry, that are California-based and that really are showing some true innovation that can help us kind of get us beyond. I know we, we have been the leaders in, in many of this industry, and as a government, we're, we're getting there, but I think we also have to continue to push ourselves to be proactive at seeking out those, those innovative things that are out there, those firms that are, that are homegrown and, and based here in California. Th thank you for bringing that up, because you reminded me of two points that I wanted to make. Uh, one is that... Um, California, because we are of such large scale, it does become challenging for uh, for smaller companies, especially newer startup companies, to take on the financial commitment of, of a large, you know, $100 million project. Uh, so there's a couple of things that we are doing. Um, one of the things that we're doing is we're, as we put out requests for, for proposals, we're starting out with saying, this is our business problem. This is the operational issue we're trying to address. And we're asking companies to come in and say, well, how would you do it? We're not specifying, this is how we want you to do it. So that does allow them to be innovative and to provide innovation. Uh, for the smaller companies, which you know, sometimes are challenged with the size of, of, our, of our procurements, we also have uh, small business targets, participation targets that we, work, that we uh, ask bidders, especially large companies, to, uh, to meet. We have them for ourselves as state agencies, and we have that for a uh, for contractors that work for the state as well. And that's another way. Uh, it's very common in California for companies to team up, and you know, especially the larger companies do look for opportunities to team up with innovative companies or companies that have innovative technology solutions. Thank you. And Mr. President, I just have one more question. I I'm sorry, I just, you know. Uh, uh, last year, the legislature approved AB60, and the DMV is in the middle of implementing uh, the legislation. Uh, and during, talk, uh, during this implementation process and, and re regulation review and development, they are in the middle of uh, ramping up their uh, website and their IT needs. Um, how can we prevent uh, any other future fiascos that have happened before on CCMS, on EDD, to not happen with the DNV enrollment, uh, unveilment of uh, AB60? So... Um one of the projects that we shut down last year was a DMV project. And one of the things that we required it when we shut it down was that they do a comprehensive assessment as to what went wrong. Uh, that assessment is complete. Uh, we shared it with the legislature, you know, I think the day it became complete or the next day. Uh, and it came away with some very valuable recommendations. And although it was focused on that project in particular, I think implementing those recommendations could, across the board, uh, would immensely help DMV in, in doing a better job in the future. So what we're doing is we're working with the department to implement those, those corrective actions and those recommendations so that they build in a better opportunity and ability to manage projects, a better way of uh, engaging the right people at the DMV and making effective decisions, effectively managing their vendors, and again, clearly identifying what objective are they trying to achieve. Uh, we're also monitoring them, monitoring them very closely and uh, engaging with, with them in the procurement of it. The, the, last, uh, the last project, that one that was shut down, that was procured under the old model years ago. They didn't have a very good contract. In my opinion, I don't think they had uh, necessarily a good procurement because they ended up with a single bidder. So, uh, so I think as we go forward, we're going to end up with a lot more knowledge about how to do good procurements, how to get multiple competitors in there, and how do you actually have a contract that it enables you to effectively manage a, an engagement. And we're going to be working hand-in-hand -hand with DMV to put in place those corrective actions. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So my questions are sort of along the same line, but basically uh, under this reform uh, of the department, you now will have the full authority and responsibility for purchasing uh, the new IT, is that correct? 
Um, it will be for IT around big projects. Other, you know, commodities like buying laptops or, uh, you know, software packages like Microsoft Windows, those sorts of things will still be with the Department of General Services, the more commodities-oriented uh, So what size is the part that you're responsible for? So it's, there's not a particular dollar amount. They're basically non, the size that are not delegated to departments, and that can range, generally speaking, if I can, say a range of anything over $5 million, and it's usually around technology projects. Okay. So this is a new opportunity that, that is being put in place in order to improve, I think, both the pricing and the quality of the equipment being purchased to keep it on task. And so how will you use this new opportunity to make these um, technology, big, large technology projects do better than they have been in the past? What are the main characteristics that you now will be able to use that authority to fix? Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, we're shortening the processes. We're, mm -hmm. making, uh, we're doing a better job of understanding how the, the contracts that result mm -hmm. out of these things can be effectively used to manage vendor performance. We're actually in the process of building out uh, a capacity to factor in vendor performance, and specifically vendor performance on California projects, into how we evaluate bids. Um, and um, doing things such as pre-qualifying vendors, you know, before you put a bid on the street, just to make sure that they have the capacity and the qualities, uh, and, qualifications. And that was the part I'd like to zero in on. You mentioned earlier pre-qualifying. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> Okay, so we're like, California is like one of the largest uh, computer systems in the world probably that, that's, you know, so you have not too many companies, I suspect, that have that kind of experience and you, we are on the leading edge, so I expect that most, there's a large part of the projects that you are asking for are new R&D for them. How do you, how do you know, how do you judge when you look at those bids, because it's got to be more than price, how do you okay. judge whether those companies have the ability to, to, absol to actually build and perform on these contracts uh, efficiently? Because they generally don't have a pre-existing package. So, um, so let, me, let me address that in a couple of ways. And, and I did want to say one other thing that we're doing that I think uh, um, will make a, a, an impact. Uh, but first let me get to how do we assess or validate, you know, that somebody has the qualifications to, to build the systems. Um, to Senator Steinberg's point earlier, uh, in, I'll give the example of the CalNet 3 contract. It's a procurement that we're doing for telecommunication services. That's an example where we broke up uh, mm -hmm. what was before just a, a massive service offering that was really ended up with two qualified bidders last time they mm -hmm. did it. Uh, we broke it up into say, okay, we're going to break it up into 14 different categories of services. So we've asked, we've pre-qualified vendors to say, okay, which of these services can you deliver? And the, what we look at is, have you actually done it anywhere? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we look at, we're in the process, we're still refining this part, but looking at from a financial capability, mm -hmm. can you pull it off? And we look at things such as customer references. Uh, and then, you know, can you meet certain state standard terms and conditions that are really meant to, to provide uh, agencies a... Uh, 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 mechanisms to manage vendor performance. So we do that ahead of time. Uh, when we did that, we ended up qualifying something like 22 or 26 uh, bidders, which is a market improvement mm -hmm. from what we had mm -hmm. last time around. And then we go out and compete among those qualified vendors for individual, uh, you know, services. So, so you get the you get the opportunity to to make sure that these folks have the capacity to actually deliver. You build in competition by having a bigger pool of qualified vendors. And then, you know, you, you, you encourage them to differentiate themselves not only on price, but also on, you know, are they able to deliver innovative technologies? Are they able to bring in uh, services in a way that, that provide additional benefits to the state? Do you at any time use clawback provisions or timeline penalties um, to to actually enforce once you have selected? We do. And, and so the way, you know, I was talking earlier about how, you know, maybe performance bonds aren't necessarily a great uh, performance management tool, but things like liquidated damages mm -hmm. and service level agreements are where you say, okay, you know, if you miss a deadline by this much or, if, you know, the quality of the deliverables are off by that much, you actually assess, 
either liquidated damages, you withhold payment. Uh, those things are very effective, and actually the vendors can live with those because they know going in yes. that, that, you know, what they're up against and what they're going to be evaluated against. It helps them not set themselves up for failure if they right. know ahead of time. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. It's always hard to go toward the end. All the good questions been asked. Uh, no, well, one subject that we talked about uh, before was uh, cybersecurity and uh, what we're doing here in California. This is obviously the biggest state, got the biggest economy, got uh, a lot of sensitive information going uh, back and forth and dealing with other countries and dealing with other um, uh, different uh, companies. So what are we doing to stay on the cutting edge of cyberspace? Um, are we there or are we uh, lagging behind? Okay, so um, so let me start with what we're doing. Um, again, when I came in, I, I used to be a departmental CIO and I used to run technology projects. One of the challenges I had was keeping up with what are actually my requirements, what are the policies that I'm supposed to comply with, because uh, they were kind of spread out and you know there was varying uh, standards that we had to uh, that we had to uh, comply with. So uh, what we did last year, I asked my folks to, uh, to basically rewrite and update the security policies, standards, and procedures, and then publish them in a central place and make them available to all of the state agencies. So they're available on our website. Um, we put them all in one section of the state administrative manual, and we aligned them with national uh, standards and best practices. And in some cases, departments have even additional standards like HIPAA, for example. Uh, so we aligned them and we published them. The next thing we did is we, we developed training and awareness uh, opportunities for the state agencies. So as an example, each year we do a cybersecurity uh, conference where we bring in literally hundreds of state uh, IT folks to train them as to here's how you comply with these, with these uh, rules and requirements and standards. Uh, we also do a lot of scaring <laughs> where we tell them, look, here's the consequences of what could happen if we're not, if we're not in compliance. It's not just that we're trying to check boxes. We're trying to prevent some of the breaches that have plagued, you know, organizations like Target or Citibank or those, those kinds of organizations. Um, this last year, we also added a training and a, a awareness for folks at the executive level. So, you know, department directors, cabinet secretaries, and cabinet members were there. We even had elected officials that sat in where we shared with them, look, th this is the responsibility. Each department is responsible for complying with these policies and practices. And we make them certify that on an annual basis that they're complying with them. And if they're not, then we help them get in, into compliance. Uh, we do training. We call it ISO. ISO is Information Security Officer uh, basic training. And we put on, uh, you know, uh, we put on a constant or, or quarterly town hall sort of training sessions for, for the technology uh, workforce of the state. Um, beyond that, um, what we've done is we've, this is something that, that we started again since I've been on board. Uh, my ISO, my Information Security Office, now reviews all project proposals before they come out, right, or before we approve them to make sure that they're thinking about building the systems right and, you know, strengthen them right from the get-go. Um, we do the same thing in procurement. We, we develop terms and conditions that contractors have to comply with. So as they're building our systems or they're operating on our behalf, that they have to meet the, the, those same sorts of security standards. Um, more broadly than that, we've reached out to the, in a public-private partnership, we've reached out to the private sector, to the law enforcement community, uh, to the emergency uh, management uh, community, myself and, and Director Gilarducci, uh, or Secretary Gilarducci of the Office of Emergency Management, uh, have coordinated a cybersecurity task force where we've asked folks from across California to come together and help us develop a framework that can be used not only for state government, but for local government, for the utilities, or any of the other uh, critical infrastructure for the state to improve California's cybersecurity posture. And then the final thing that we're doing is um, we stay in very close communi communication and you know, participate in the, the multi-state information sharing and advisory council. It's called MSISAC. And what it is, it's a, it's a body of information security specialists which share information on threats as they see them. You know, new threats that are developing, the impact of those, and, and response uh, capabilities. Uh, they're also working on developing forensic capabilities. So when something does happen, 
we have the ability to go in and do the forensics to figure out what happened, did anybody get anything, and how do we remediate or address the issue. And then uh, lastly, thank you for that answer. Um, what are we doing about interconnectivity? Um, you know, so many times we hear in government that uh, if you go into this place, it's a square hole, and if you go into this place in government, it's a round hole, and so sure. there's, there's not uh, the right hand talking to the left hand. What are we doing as we upgrade to make sure that, uh, that different groups and, and government as a whole can communicate and can, uh, can be connected with each other? Um, so this last year, uh, we published what we call our Enterprise Architecture Framework. And essentially what it is is to look at those things that departments do in common in the technology space and figure out do we really need to buy, for example, a, an identity access piece of a component or a payment processing uh, component to a technology system 15 different times and in 15 different ways. Wouldn't it be better to just buy it once or maybe buy two flavors of it and make that available as a service to the different agencies that need it? Uh, that helps with, in, with connectivity. It helps manage the diversity of the technology environment and helps us to, to focus our limited resources on, uh, in, in information security to keep those, those uh, components safe. So that's a framework that we're going to do kind of like we did with information security. We published it, we, we've educated departments about it, and now we're, we're going to go into enforcing it. So as new projects come in, they're not going to get approved unless they're in compliance with that or unless they're leveraging the shared services that are out there. Okay. Very good. You know, um, I did want to put in a plug, if I could, just on, on cybersecurity since you asked. One of the last pieces that we need to do now is, is not just rely on departments to do um, self-certifications of compliance. So we have a BCP that's going to be before the Senate. It's been before the Assembly already, where we're asking for, for positions and resources to actually go out and do compliance audits, where we go to departments and say, okay, you say you're complying with the policies? Let's see. Let's take a look at your systems. Let's see that if you have an encryption policy and you're following it. You're, you say you, you're sending your staff to do security and, and awareness training. Let's see your, pro, your program and your curriculum. So that, that'll be before the, the Senate uh, very soon as well. Good. Thank you. Senator Mitchell. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Pro Tem. Um, thank you for the conversation. I enjoyed it uh, and, and appreciate your vision around a culture shift that's clearly needed in terms of the role government plays in IT. And I agree and, and, and echo the questions raised by my colleagues around procurement and, and how we've learned from past mistakes. The one area that I didn't hear touched on and I want to focus on a little bit, and that's the IT workforce. Yes. I share with you uh, my personal, professional nightmare experience in leading a large organization in a large um, purchase, development, design, and, and transition into a, a large um, IT project. And what I learned there and what I've learned subsequently as an elected official in, in touring a couple of organizations in my district, uh, namely a large health plan and how they transitioned to online um, medical records and the issue around training, you know, even docs, getting them to learn a sure. new system and a culture shift in terms of how you do your work. Um, so I'm really curious from your perspective about what are the state's greatest IT skill deficits and what do you plan to do to address those issues? Because sure. we can have the best system that can sing and whistle and if, if, the, if the state um, employees, our state workers, um, can't manage it, can't use it, it doesn't make their work more efficient and streamline the process, then it will all be for naught. So from your perspective, what are, what are our deficits? Um, so I would say I'll tell you two deficits that I would see mm -hmm. that we have today mm -hmm. and one that's coming. <laughs> so just to mm -hmm. scare you a little bit. Uh, the two that I see today are primarily around how you manage effectively projects. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's a challenge for the state workforce, and we're working on it. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what we're doing in that regard. Mm -hmm. And then the second one is with the newer technologies. As you know, new technologies come, in, come into being, whether it's the cloud or uh, GIS, the mapping technologies, mm -hmm. or uh, mobile computing, uh, those, are, those are real data analytics is another one. Those are a real challenge for the state, one, to compete with the private sector to, to get the people coming out of the technical schools or out of college mm -hmm. to bring them into government. And mm -hmm. a lot of them don't really even realize that government does these sorts of technologies. Mm -hmm. So those are the, the two skill gaps that I see today. Mm -hmm. 
the third one that I think is coming is around the big mainframe or the legacy technologies. Mm -hmm. And the reason that one's coming is because our workforce that knows that, that technology are retiring. are retiring. Right. So I'll talk about what we're doing there as well. Um, so let me start with the, the first two I mentioned. Mm -hmm. In the area of projects and, and how to successfully deliver projects, I mentioned we've done assessments of projects that have failed. Mm -hmm. We've gone out and actually uh, you know, commissioned folks to go out and say, Let's, what lessons have we learned? And what are the common issues that, that plague projects? And mm -hmm. we've developed our list that we you know, jokingly refer to as our dirty dozen. <laughs> um, and now we've developed a training curriculum around that mm -hmm. and a training, a project academy, mm -hmm. specifically to train state people. And we're being, they're being trained by state people that are doing these projects that are, that are successful at it as to how do you successfully deliver projects. Mm -hmm. In fact, in June, we're, we're partnering with the private sector to put on a conference specifically on how do you effectively deliver technology projects. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're building a curriculum around that. We're working with UC Davis as well as, as Sac State uh, in delivering some of that content and some of that, that training as well. Mm -hmm. I think in the long run, that'll have a big impact on, on California's track record. Uh, in the area of the more innovative and newer technologies, mm -hmm. uh, again, we're partnering with the private sector and putting on very specifically focused training conferences. Uh, so, for example, in the last two years, we put on uh, conferences on mobile computing, a uh, conference on, on big data uh, on, and data analytics, on cybersecurity, and on, uh, I'm missing one, oh, on cloud computing. Mm -hmm. So what we do there is we go out to the private sector and say, we'll bring the folks, we'll, you know, we'll gather the, uh, the, uh, the folks that work in that field, you know, we'll provide the facilities. You bring us your experts, and we don't want commercials. What we want is your experts that, that, to come in and educate and train these folks. Uh, so we're building curriculums around those as well. And that's also having a good impact. What we try to do at those uh, conferences, too, is to bring in actual examples of state agencies or, you know, public sector entities that mm -hmm. are doing something in those spaces mm -hmm. and showcase what they've done. Mm -hmm. uh, and what that does is it spurs, it spurs a lot of innovation and ideas. Mm -hmm in other agencies. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the last one that I mentioned was, you know, dealing with our legacy technologies. Mm -hmm. The schools, you know, if they're teaching those technologies, the students aren't necessarily that thrilled about going after them. So what we're doing is we're building our own curriculum and mm -hmm. trying to grow our own experts. Mm -hmm. So we have, for example, our mainframe university mm -hmm. uh, that, again, taught by state people, by folks that know how to do this uh, in a state environment to state employees. And we do reach out to the universities and say, hey, uh, send us a couple of your engineering students or your, your computer science students to take on a project for the state. You know, they'll get credit for it, and at the same time, maybe it, it encourages them to consider government as, a, as an employment once they graduate. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Just to, just to bring it around full circle, because um, we've talked a lot about, and I appreciate it's necessary, um, protocol and study for how to examine failures and, and how to avoid them in the future. But I want to ask the question in a different way. Maybe there's an obvious answer to this. But when was California's last $100 million or greater mainframe tech project that was a success? Last $100 million plus mainframe I guess that, project. That's just I drew the line. When, when was the last time we used mainframe you know, technology? It, if I'm using the right terms here, um, for a major yeah. state IT project that has been a success. You know, to, to talk about a mainframe technology specifically, I, I would honestly have to look at it. I'd have to go back and, and get back to you on that. D but I can tell you the doesn't last... Come to doesn't, doesn't, uh, well, because, because because right it, doesn't come to mind. Doesn't come right off the... <laughs> Well, because you threw in mainframe. Okay. If you're well, talking about I'm, just the I, large, I don't want, I'm not trying large. to trick you in terms no, no. of. I'm not trying to trick you in terms of uh, the vernacular. What when was the last new system that involved? Those I can tell you several examples. Hardware. <laughs> How's that? Right. Is that it? How about the large, the last large hundred million dollar plus system that was rolled out? Correct. Okay. How's thank that? you. That's my question. Uh, uh, there's a, there's several. Psalms okay. is one that I just talked about. The state offender management system at Corrections. Uh, CMIPS, which is the case management information and payrolling system uh, that literally is processing payroll for, uh, you know, several hundred thousand. Uh, That's software home or hardware? It's both. You know, bo most of these systems include both hardware okay. and software. 
Uh, and if you look at our strategic plan, there's probably a good six or seven other ones that are named in there. But, you know, Senator, California really does deliver technology systems. You just don't hear about the successful ones. But CMIPS is one, SOMS is one, uh, and, you know, I can, I can think of a couple of other ones if you give me a couple minutes here. Okay. Well, you know, I go, I go back to this, and, and again, I know that change is... Oh, CalHERS is another one. Cal... CalHERS, the, Cal uh, the Health Benefit Exchange. We were just talking about that. But yeah. that actually worked. Right, okay. Well, again, I just wonder whether or not we ought to be moving even more aggressively from the large single vendor project to, to using, as you say, the new technology and the cloud to better connect existing systems in a way that does not put us at risk for failure with, uh, with putting all of our resources into the hands of one, of one company, sure. whoever the bidder is. I mean, it just, it just strikes me we're just having a little fun here doing a little... <laughs> A little research here. What did I? Yeah, EDR you. is that another one that just came Kim Kardashian. Kim. EDR. Me. Sorry. Kim Kardashian has 20.6 million Twitter followers. Why? Why? <laughs> you ask. <laughs> Why? But I mean, I don't know. That means 20.6 million people out there are, are have the ability to intersect and interact with one another. Uh, you know, on, on one sure. sort of existing platform. And so, sure. you know, we look at the number of state employees, the number of people who are, uh, who are seeking to access health care. We look at all these differences. And it just makes you wonder whether or not this old way of doing it, even with all of the changes you're making and, and the protections and the accountability and all that you're building in, is maybe missing the point here. And I understand you say that with large projects, we need we, we need a singular infrastructure, if you will. You need that you need that hardware. But then I, I look at that number, twenty point sure. six million. Kim, I don't know about Chloe, by the way. I, <laughs> we we did not we, we did not well, we did not research that or Justin Bieber or or anybody else. Well, but I'm just saying, this this there are a lot of people interacting out there sure. on. Uh, on a cloud, you, and and apparently pretty well. I, I didn't mean to give you the impression that we're not also leveraging those sorts of technologies. They're called social media technologies. And so I don't know that, this, that you know, for example, the DMV has 26 million followers on Twitter, but they do leverage Twitter, they leverage Facebook, they leverage YouTube, and, and most state departments do to actually connect with consumers as well. So, so we're not ignoring those. We, we actually do use those, uh, those sorts of technologies. Uh, it's just that, you know, Twitter may not be the, necessarily the platform to deliver. I, I'm not saying that it is. I just, it was for, sure. for sake of, for sake sure. of example. Okay. Let's hear from witnesses in support, please. Mr. London. Yes, yes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and members. Uh, Carl London here today on behalf of uh, Tech America. Uh, we are uh, one of the largest leading voices for uh, information and communications technologies industry in the country, DC-based trade group with a large California presence. Uh, Senator Lara, you'll be happy to know that the uh, clearly the largest stake for this uh, particular association is here in California. I will uh, mention that the gap is closed slightly, but it's still tremendously in California's favor. Uh, we have approximately 34,000 active members, do consist of small, medium, and large-sized businesses that uh, provide a variety of services. And I think uh, just as much as anything, not to belabor it, our particular trade group wants to endorse uh, Mr. Ramos. We found him to be a, a great consensus builder in the, in the position that he's had. Um, we think he's got a unique blend of both government and private sector experience that he brings to the table that uh, benefits the state and across the country has served California in a leadership position uh, really with the respect of his peers uh, who serve as CIOs in other states. So we wanted to bring our strongest endorsement for him in this position as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Lane. Any other witnesses in support of the nominee? 
All right. Uh, any witnesses in opposition? Any witnesses who were principally neutral? Any? <laughs> any <laughs> anybody? Anybody agnostic? Anybody? <laughs> Um, I appreciate um, I, I appreciate your your answer and your public service, and I think it's you know helpful to me anyways to have had this opportunity twice because you know the first time I think we talked a lot about accountability and who was accountable, and you're, you're clearly accountable, and you, you embrace that, and you're, and you're thinking about all of these things as the expert and as the lead that many of us lay people. Well, elected officials are thinking about here in terms of one, how to maximize the chance we aren't going to have future failures, but two, maybe even more deeply than, you know, there, there is the technique or the pr process and procedure, but then there's the substance of it as well and whether or not the, the overall approach is the, is the correct one. And I think you've given us some, at least me, some insight here into, into some of the complexities and some of the balance here, and I know that you'll continue to push the envelope to make sure that we are turning it around, procuring technology in the most cost-efficient but effective way, um, and, and that you'll be innovative in doing so. Thank you. Very good. Moved by Senator Lara. Please call the roll. Senators Knight. Aye. Knight, aye. Lara. Aye. Laura I. Mitchell? Aye. Mitchell I. Fuller? Aye. Fuller I. Steinberg? Aye. Steinberg I. Very good. That's five times. Congratulations. Thank you. Feel free to come back a third time if you would. Yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>